Afghanistan's presidential poll finally has a result. The Election Commission declares victory for Ashraf Ghani, but his political rival cries foul. Could the chaos jeopardize the country's chance for peace? I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is the political instability in Afghanistan. It's been five months since Afghans went to the polls, yet only last week did authorities give the win to Ashraf Ghani. But the uncertainty remains. Within hours, Ghani's rival, Abdullah Abdullah, rejected the result, and he's already started forming his own parallel government. Now, it's not the first time these two have been involved in a disputed election. In 2014, a similar scenario forced the U.S. to intervene and make them work together, which didn't work out so well. And this time, the stakes may even be higher. The U.S. and the Taliban have agreed to a week-long reduction in violence. And if that holds... It may bring an end to almost two decades of war. But could the Ghani Abdullah rivalry threaten to derail the peace process? Francis Collings reports. Afghanistan's presidential election was held on September the 29th. But it took until last week for the incumbent, Ashraf Ghani, to be declared the winner. With our united team, we will always safeguard the rights of the Afghan people. But unity is something that's been missing for quite a while. No sooner had the result been announced than the defeated candidate, Abdullah Abdullah, dismissed Ghani's victory as a fraud. Election robbery, a coup against democracy, the betrayal of the will of the people, and we consider it to be illegal. It's been a fraught last five years of government in Afghanistan, with tension and rifts between Ghani and his chief executive that have often paralyzed matters of state. Now Abdullah says he'll set up a parallel government. The latest disagreements between the country's two most senior leaders could not have come at a more sensitive time after talks were initiated in 2018 between the United States and the Taliban. The two sides are finally on the verge of a peace deal. It may see the end of nearly 19 years of war. Uh, we think uh, they want to make a deal, we want to make a deal. I think it's going to work out, we'll see. On Saturday, a week-long reduction in violence was announced, ahead of the proposed signing of a deal next weekend. The Taliban of Delhi. Now that the Taliban have agreed to a reduction in violence, it is also an essential step towards a ceasefire and lasting peace. Talks would then follow between the Afghan government and the Taliban on the immediate political future of the country. But if the government is divided, it would weaken its hand in the negotiations. And could another dispute between Ghani and Abdullah derail the peace deal, plunging Afghanistan into another prolonged period of chaos and violence? Francis Collings, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now in Kabul is Ziaul Haq Amar Khil. He's a senior advisor to President Ashraf Ghani on political and public affairs. And also in Kabul, we have a former Afghan MP, Farhunda Zahra Naderi. She was once an advisor to President Ghani, but is now a part of what Abdullah Abdullah calls his stability and partnership team. It's good to have you both on The Newsmakers. Farhunda Zahra Naderi, if I can begin with you, ma'am. Is there any proof of fraud? Or is this just a case of Abdullah Abdullah being a, a sore loser with a bruised ego? Well, as you correctly mentioned, uh, for the announcement of the election, it took the election bodies to announce it within five, year, five months. If there was not any case of um, fraud, they wouldn't uh, extend it to that level. And at the same time, there were 300,000 votes uh, that uh, was not um, acceptable votes and they were not legitimate votes. Uh, so out of that, 102,000 uh, 102, votes were out of the time of voting process. 
so it was very much clear to the whole country, the whole nation, that there were very high level of frauds. Actually, in the previous election, we also had a level of frauds <laughs> in a country that is moving towards democracy. Um, it, it seems to be natural to, to, to make the steps towards democracy years by years to make the um, institution strong. But um, unfortunately, in this election, it was the worst election ever we had it. Um, the election which was um, actually giving the worst um, signs of um, uh, transparency was the parliamentary election. And uh, people had hoped that presidential election will be an opportunity to build trust again to the institution and people can come and, and vote. And one of the reasons that people didn't vote and uh, the ceiling of the voting was not very high because uh, the parliamentary election, which were before the presidential election, actually discouraged the public, the public because Afghan people, when they go and they, they vote, it's not like a normal country that they just go and just uh, give or invest their time. They also take the risk of their life to go and vote. Okay. So people were discouraged because of those reasons. Okay. One more point. In 2014, I was saying that Afghan um, institutions and Afghan democracy is a teenage. It's 14 years old. So give it some time that it can get better. So today, Afghan democracy is 18 years old. And 18 years old, Afghan citizens can go and vote and even determine okay. the future of the country. So the expectation of Afghan of this country, the citizen of Afghanistan, was higher from um, institutions and Farkunda, responsible people, Farkunda, we, including... You're going to eat up all uh, the time in this segment. Yes. I've got to get Zia's perspective here. So that's the view from Abdullah Abdullah's camp. They're not happy. They've set up a parallel government, or in the, they're in the process of that. And in his role as chief executive, they've barred the electoral official, the commission officials, from, from leaving the country. Zeaul Haq Amarkhil, you've heard their argument. Are you willing to engage with it for the sake of peace? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first, uh, let me thank the TRT and as well as, I mean, especially the participants, um, uh, Ms. Zohra Nadari, for participating in this roundtable and discussing the Afghanistan election. Honestly, the 28th of September election was a big achievement for the people of Afghanistan and as well as for the democracy. It means the democracy <coughs> was the win and as well as the people of Afghanistan win this election. And we congratulate them. Plus, the 28th of September election, prior to the election, there was a huge propaganda was going on that the election will not take place even though there was a preparation for the election commission side, plus even the candidates was um, not a bit sure that the election will take place because the propaganda was going on. But thanks God, the election did take place <laughs> and people did participate. And it was election that was across the country. And first time the election commission used technology in that election. And uh, though there was some challenges, but uh, it was overall a good election, it was acceptable election. The election commission is the body that they are, they are legally is authorized to conduct the election, and legally the election commission is responsible to announce the final result and as well as to give accreditation to the winner candidate. The election commission announced the election and did give the accreditation to the winner candidate, which is Dr. Ashraf Ghani. It means the, the, uh, the, the legal authority or the legal uh, body is, is election commission. They conducted election. They announced the final result. And they did give the accreditation okay. to Dr. Okay, so Rani. Okay. It means Dr. Okay. Rani you is it's officially okay. is the president okay. of Afghanistan. OK, Farkhunda Zahra Naderi, looking at it from the outside, you would accept that people see this at the same time as the Taliban uh, agreeing this reduction in violence um, period with the United States that could hopefully pave the way to them putting down their guns. It's a bad time to have political disunity, isn't it? You would agree that people would say, well, how can you have peace with the Taliban if you can't have unity even among Afghan leaders? Do you accept that? If you look at the current situation, the first thing that you see this um, uh, 
political crisis or whatever name you will give it to the country, the first evaluation that comes in your mind is there is not a good leader for five years who could unite Afghanistan and make it prepared for this upcoming peace process to, um, to go and sit around the table with Taliban. So the character who will be, take this responsibility will be the president of Afghanistan. Even if you go and look at the group during the campaign time, the Afghan political group isolated the uh, ex-president of Afghanistan, Mr. Ghani, and they came and joined Mr. Abdullah. Uh, and the majority of them actually came. Uh, I always believe that, you know, um, political refugees within the country is always natural because politicians can change their agenda and their position and they, they can uh, sh uh, sh shift from one group to another. But to have it to that high level from president, one group joined the uh, election and the rest of them, not one group, actually, different group joined the election. And the one who didn't join the election and joined peace, they also don't have good relation with the president. So the ex-president of Afghanistan failed to exhibit leadership inside the country. When we come to the election, it is not only uh, um, uh, Mr. Abdullah who actually rejected uh, the um, the result of election, you can also see that different uh, candidates like Mr. Hikmatyar, Mr. Right. Nabil, and the rest of the candidate, okay. they rejected that so because the that. level of fraud so was very high. And, and at the same time, allow me to just add this point, the process was not finished because 16,000 cases before getting finished after five, year, uh, five months all of a sudden, the uh, commission were hijacked by a power, and they had to announce okay. in favor of an individual, okay. disregarding the whole uh, legal structure and the votes that was given by the people during that time. Okay, so let's take what you said here, because, Zia, it's not only about the Taliban maybe exploiting your differences or exploiting the gaps of your differences, and this possibly leading to instability. Not only do you have... 40% of people, even if the official results are to be believed, 40% of the people voted for Abdullah Abdullah, right? And now, as he contests it, you have major parties comprised of Uzbeks, Tajiks, Hazaras, and so on, backing Abdullah Abdullah, saying we don't accept Ashraf Ghani as our president. Something needs to happen here. Ashraf Ghani has to engage with these people, right? He can't just wish it away and say, I won and shut his ears. Is it a question for Zia me? Zia Yes. Uh, honestly, uh, you know what happened, uh, Perer, the election, the, the election commission bodies, commissioners, and as well as the election complaint commission, uh, commissioner was supposed to be appointed by the president, but the president did not appoint them. It was more, I mean, like the candidates voted for them. And Dr. Ghani had uh, only one vote. It means the election commission body in the election complaint commission body commissioner was appointed by the candidates. It means Nobody should accuse the government and nobody should accuse Dr. Ghani that he did interfere. There was a zero interference from the government side, especially from the security organization. The only security organization was providing security to the election, and thanks God they did provide it. The second is, 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 is that Dr. Abdullah, since he's accusing that uh, this was not a good election, this is not the first time. He did it in 2009. He was accusing Ms. Uh, ex-president uh, Karzai in as well as he did accuse in 2014. It means like he had the same issue in 2014. <laughs> this is not the first time. Every single Afghan know that he doesn't believe an election. He doesn't believe in democracy. And that's why every single time he's challenging the election. And, and plus, if okay. you look to his background b before okay. 2001, most of I mean like the worlders is just standing next to okay. him. And now so they're announcing Okay. the Pearl okay, government. So this right. time, the people okay. of Afghanistan will stand, and the people of Afghanistan will support democracy, right. and the people of Afghanistan is supporting election. We have okay. legally Haq, elected wrap. government, and the election right. commission has already announced the final result. Okay, you're hanging a question mark over the credibility of, of, of those who are questioning the result. We're going to keep a close eye on this. We're going to invite you both back onto the program. 
very soon as this story unfolds. I thank you sincerely for joining us on this episode of The Newsmakers. Well, as you just saw from the debate there, the political situation remains unstable. And some of the biggest victims of this instability are Afghan refugees. Last week, I spoke to the UNHCR chief, Filippo Grandi, in Islamabad. I began by asking him if people underestimate the magnitude of the problem faced by those forced to flee Afghanistan. We are here in Islamabad to observe the 40th anniversary of the first exodus of Afghan refugees from Afghanistan. This was following the Soviet invasion of 1979. Millions came out of the country during those years. And um, millions have gone back, but uh, as many continue to be hosted by Iran and Pakistan in particular. So it is still one of the large refugee crises of our contemporary world. And uh, because so many other crises have occurred in between, there is a tendency to think that this one has gone away. It's still there, it still needs a solution, and the people affected still need support, and the countries hosting refugees in particular need more support. So 1979, you have a Soviet invasion. After that, Mujahideen. After that, Taliban. After that, the US invasion. And its aftermath, right? Still no political settlement. Yes, they're talking in Doha and they're talking elsewhere. War continues to rage. There's no peace, there's no settlement. Do you feel disheartened that there's a ceiling in terms of what you can do? You've been involved in dealing with Af Afghan refugees for a long, long time. Ultimately, there's no political settlement. This is going to continue to create refugees no matter what you do. You know, in my job, dealing with the consequences, the human consequences of uh, failed politics, there is one thing that I cannot afford to be, and that's disheartened. I have to always try, my colleagues and I, we always have to try to find a way forward, a solution. Sometimes the solution is good, there is a political settlement, a political agreement that paves the way for the return of refugees to their country. That's always the best solution. Most of the other times, this context doesn't materialize. And so we have to find new ways to help them while in exile, to find solutions for them, at least temporarily, while they cannot go back home. And this has been the challenge with Afghan refugees for a very long time. Afghan refugees are being told, you can go back home, you should go back home. Is that wrong? Is that unfair? Well, uh, one also has to be nuanced in that respect. If you look at this long history that you were referring to, 40 years, there's been at least two moments when Afghan refugees went back. One was 92, after the withdrawal of the Soviet troops. Another time was 2002, after the fall of the Taliban government. And uh, there were moments of hope moments of uh, uh, prospects of stability, and they were immediately filled by people saying, I want to go back. I was in Kabul in 2002. I was actually the head of UNHCR in Kabul, and we were almost taken by surprise by the number of people every day, in tens of thousands every day, uh, boarding trucks and going back to their homes under very difficult circumstances, under very fragile circumstances, voting with their feet for their future in their country. Now, these things happen. The question is, both times, 92 and 2002, their expectations were not fully met. And uh, uh, conflict resumed in different forms, in different uh, ways. And uh, unfortunately, these movements ended there. In fact, some people went out of the country after that. So it is very important that when these moments happen, which are political in nature, military in nature, they are immediately sub supported and sustained by adequate intervention by the international community to stabilize peace agreements and give a future to people who want to go back. But again, it's the politics. Countries don't want them. Right? So we look at it objectively on the ground. Yes, there's hope that there'll be a peace deal. The United States has dropped more bombs in the past year than ever before in Afghanistan. There have been more civilian deaths in the past year 
than since 2001. The Taliban killing people, the, the US and its allies and the Afghan government killing civilians as well. It's not safe. And yet you have people from Sweden to the Netherlands to Turkey to Germany and so on, Afghans who are applying for asylum and having their asylum claims rejected. They're being pushed back into the fire. Um, I want to just go back to your first statement. Right. Uh, nobody wants them. This is not true. This country, Pakistan, has hosted them for 40 years. Iran has hosted millions for 40 years. So there is, in this region, strong sense of uh, hospitality. There's been ups and downs. There's been more difficult moments uh, in both countries, more pressures for people to go back. But by and large, those countries have stayed the course and have hosted millions. Uh, the examples you're giving refer, regrettably, to richer countries with more resources that uh, because, not of the Afghans, but because of other dynamics that we know very well, uh, the use of uh, migration or of migrants and refugees as a kind of political scapegoat to gain consensus by certain politicians. The hype around this issue has resulted in tighter asylum policies. Now, we know that. We're trying to address it. Our advice to all countries, in fact, receiving asylum requests from Afghans is to be extremely prudent in making those decisions that are about life and death. Before deciding that an Afghan is, who, who seeks asylum is not a refugee and therefore can be deported to his or her country, they have to think long and hard because the situation in Afghanistan as it is now is still very fragile. And you could expose people to great danger by sending them back. So when we look at these rich countries that you speak of, Maybe Greece is not as rich as it used to be, but it's considered a, a country that people want to get into in Europe as a first port of entry. I've had discussions with Greek politicians and others who say that, well, it's hard enough and, and it's complicated enough for us to deal with Syrians, and now you want us to deal with, with Afghans. The country you come from, Italy, they've had a harsher, more xenophobic tone, at least from the politicians over the past few years. And again, for them, it almost seems to be, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of summarize the argument based on the multiple conversations I've had over the past few years. When you speak to Europeans in a populist age, in a nationalist age, they go, oh, well, if we are going to take anybody, given the current situation, we'll take Syrians, because Syria is actively under war. But Afghanistan, there's some question marks over it. The Afghans are seen as a sort of second tier. Is it hard for you to make that? that argument that Afghans are also people who are desperate and who um, many of them don't have a choice when they leave their homes? You know, um, in um, judging uh, asylum claims, one has to always be a little bit careful not to generalize, not to say all people from this country should be considered refugees, all asylum seekers from this country should not be. A lot, many times, it depends on individual situations. Europe, in particular because you're talking about Europe, has a very sophisticated adjudication system, asylum system. And we're asking them to use it properly, more efficiently. We've made many suggestions to how to do that. But to err, if anything, in the case of the Afghans, on the side of caution because of the situation that I have described. Now, there may be some cases that uh, do not qualify as refugees. We believe that the majority probably do. You know, it also depends very much on which country has to judge. Uh, acceptance rates vary, but in some countries they're still fairly high in respect of Afghans, in others are not high. But again, I think that has, you know, the system exists to make a sound judgment on whether somebody is a refugee or not. We're asking that it is applied to Afghans without prejudice as it is applied to other countries that seem more obvious. But we certainly discourage the notion that one has to pick and choose which refugees to take in from which country. This is, should not be the fundamental way of making judgment. What's the end game? What's the ultimate goal? That Afghanistan is peaceful enough 
so that people have the choice to go back home or that they should go back home? I think your former point is how I would see it. At least ideally, it should be like that. It should be, let's create, let's help Afghans, because it is their process in the end. Let's help Afghans create conditions in their country that allow people to make that decision. I am convinced that if uh, those conditions evolve in that direction, and this is a multifaceted process. It is political, it is uh, security, very much security. It is also developmental infrastructure. You, you have to act on a variety of tracks to reach those conditions. I think that if, if the country moves back in that direction, uh, there will be many refugees opting for return. Others may not do so, not quickly or not at all, and we will have to then find solutions for them as well. Now, it's very interesting that uh, in this country, in Pakistan, in Iran, for those that are not registered as refugees, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of Afghans that are living in these two countries that are not registered as refugees. Uh, there is a process of uh, um, registration for them as well, or there was a process, and of issuance of passports so that and visas so that they can make, become regular migrants. Afghanistan will continue to be a country in need of remittances, is in that need getting, of migration. Is that and that's getting a better solution. Now? Is that getting better Well, uh, you know, this, uh, this track, this migration track, for some Afghans at least, uh, could not even be discussed some years back. Now it's a discussion, it's actually a process. So this is another track for solution. But for that as well, you need stability in the region so that migration, as has been for centuries in this part of the world, becomes a normal economic dynamics. Filippo Grandi there. Thank you for watching the Newsmakers. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.